Is that readable for everybody? Hi, everyone. We we'll started here. Uh, welcome. We uh, thought we'd toss things up a little bit this month and not go to the catechism, but to think a little bit and reflect about what the heck did Luther have to say about Advent, Christmas, Incarnation, and the like. Um, yeah, because it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's lots of, you know, and again, we have such access to the historical writings um, that it's actually really kind of fruitful um, and helpful to think about that. Um, and it's helpful as we come to think about kind of what is the theology of Advent and Christmas for us today as contemporary 21st century Lutherans? How is that alike and how is that different from... 16th century Reformation era um, things. And so I think we'll find today that there's some things that are the same and some things that are blastedly different. Um, and a lot of that's based on Luther's context versus our context. But um, a couple of pieces before we start. Um, one, if you're interested, uh, there's a couple of books that I think are helpful here. Uh, one is just a new uh, edition of Luther's Christmas Sermons. Yeah, this is mine. If you want to borrow it for your own edification and personal reading, um, go for it. <laughs> um, the other, and this is a majority of the resources that I used, um, come from this little book. It's just recently republished this year. Roland Bainton is a church historian who wrote one of the early um, biographies of Luther that took hold called Here I Stand. He put together, I believe it is, in... 1948, he went through and edited and put together themes from all of Luther's Advent and Christmas sermons on different topics related to, uh, it, and it's called Martin Luther's Christmas Book. And it is thin and accessible, and you don't know where stuff comes from, so it's not a great historical reference, but it makes for an easy read um, and is a really helpful piece as well. But um, before we get started, I just like to start with, are there any questions that you hope we can answer about Luther's thoughts about Advent, Christmas, Incarnation, and the like? Anything you're dying to know that we might be able to answer? All a new learning for everybody? No, I just have one. Yeah, Judy. Um, they always say that Luther was anti-Semitic. Yeah. And how does that relate to this story of the Jews? <laughs> yes, yep. there's a whole treatise in 1523 that Luther writes called That Jesus Christ Was Born a Jew. Um, and that isn't necessarily in the Christmas sermons as much, but, but that does, um, the notion that Jesus is born to a Jewish peasant girl named Mary um, and grows up within the Jewish tradition um, is for Luther a sign that God um, is continuing the promises of Israel through the Messiah, Jesus. Where Luther gets sticky, and where Luther, I think, is misguided, um, is that his judgment is the Jews are all damned to hell because they don't recognize him. And that becomes not only a moral judgment for Luther, it becomes a character judgment, it becomes uh, an ethnic judgment, it gets out of hand. Um, but that Luther would see Christ's birth as a human, coming to Mary and Joseph, Hebrew people, um, as a sign of the continuation of the promises of the Old Testament. Um, and so the Christmas text isn't one where that necessarily gets picked up, other than the fact that it's used later uh, to talk a little bit about that as well. So that's, that's the best I can you. give you directly there. Yeah, that's a good question, though. Let's hop in um, to some overall back on material before we get into the fun stuff. Uh, we've got 18 different a aspects here that we can get through as many as we want to um, to see about what we know about Luther and Advent and Christmas and incarnation. What do you think incarnation is? Anyone want to give us a good textbook definition? Becoming flesh. Becoming flesh, right. Salsa con carne. Same, same root there in Spanish. Um, God becoming our flesh. Yep. Yeah. Any other definitions? That's a good one. God becoming human, essentially. Um, so sometimes there's a focus on the fleshiness of it. Sometimes there's a focus on the humanness. Either way, um, it's the main theology of Christmas. 
Um, God is present. God is present. God with us. Emmanuel. Yep. Um, and it, it really becomes the focus of a lot of our Christmas hymns, about our Advent hymns as we think about those too. So a few notes about Luther and Christmas. Um, as we've learned le studying Luther this year with 500 years of Reformation, um, Luther is mistakenly attributed to have been created a lot of traditions that he didn't. <laughs> and a couple of those have to do with Christmas. Um, it's thought that he is the one to have introduced the Tannenbaum. Um, because there are many works of art uh, from the Reformation and afterwards that have added a Christmas tree to scenes of Luther and his family. But there is no um, attributable history that suggests he was the first one to do it. But later, that artist added that in, just like um, we might add a computer, <laughs> you know, or a, a cell phone into some part of our art today, you know, as a means of catching it up to <clears throat> the time. So there is not actually any proof of that. The other big piece is that uh, I grew up, and it even says in our hymnal, that Martin Luther is the text writer of Away in the Manger. Um, but there is no attributable history that tells us that either. In fact, uh, most people think that Away in the Manger is attributed to him as like a gift because it was written, people think, for the 400th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. That's the oldest copies that we have of that text. Um, so, in case you hear anyone say, Martin Luther wrote that beautiful in Away in the Manger, you can go, but did he really? <laughs> And you can blame me if people give, if you want to get into a fight. <laughs> the other big thing um, that we think about when it comes to Christmas is that within the German medieval world, Christmas wasn't really a holiday. Um, in the 1500s, the Germans celebrated Christmas only in church. It was not a secular celebration like we know it today. We have Coca-Cola, thank for that, in Germany and in America. Um, but St. Nicholas Day, oh, yeah. St. Nicholas Day is December 6th, and it was the primary cultural festival. Uh, and so that's a real mind mess to me, <laughs> because when we think about Luther and Christmas, we have all of the kind of cultural, social trappings of what we understand it to be. That's not present for Luther, it's only about Jesus being born. Um, and, um, but that doesn't mean Luther doesn't have some opinions about St. Nicholas Day, too. Uh, Luther is often aggrieved, which is a fancy way of saying he's PO'd, um, at what he sees as a cult of saint worship in the Roman Catholic tradition. And so he's skeptical about St. Nicholas Day. He calls it a childish legend. Now, St. Nicholas is a bishop uh, from Myra, which is now in present-day Turkey. He's thought to have uh, cared for the poor. Um, and that had become St. Nicholas, that later becomes jolly old St. Nicholas, which later becomes, in the Dutch, Sinterklaas, Santa Claus. Still to this day in Germany, uh, you still put out your shoes on St. Nicholas night, and if you're good, you get fruit or candy. And if you're bad, you get a potato. <laughs> or a piece of coal. Yeah. But the potato, not a very tasty thing to eat in your shoe. Um, so Luther called all of that childish stuff. So I don't think Luther would be a big fan of our Christmas gift giving, um, in all honesty. But he did understand that those gifts could teach children. And so one of the things Luther does is he reappropriates Jesus on St. Nicholas Day and says it's the Christ child who is the gift giver. It's not some magical man. It's not the saint. It's the Christ child. So in his own way, he's creating and, and constructing his own theology that understands Jesus as the, the gift giver. Most of Luther's preaching on Christmas and Advent um, is a little bit earthy. Um, it's, it's muddy. And most of it focuses on what uh, one writer calls the meanness and the misery of the biblical birth narratives. Now, meanness is not <coughs> grumbly. It's the humbleness. It's the poverty. It's the simpleness. 
So think of that hymn, why lies he in such mean estate? That's the term of mean <laughs> that they mean here. Um, this is fascinating to me. I still am amazed at this. Luther preached 110 Christmas sermons that are preserved. Oh, wow. 110 <laughs> that are preserved. And half of them are on the typical Christmas narrative that we have Luke 2. Now, um, what verses in Mark are uh, the Christmas story in? Anyway, no? There aren't any. Mark has no Christmas story. No birth narrative whatsoever. We'll hear the very beginning of Mark's gospel next Sunday. It was a trick question. Um, and theoretically, the gospel of John has its own creation story. In the beginning was the word, the word became flesh. That's incarnation. But it has nothing, there's nothing in John about Mary and Joseph, about shepherds or wise men either. So all of our Christmas texts in church only come from two of the four Gospels, Matthew and Luke. Um, and they don't agree um, about a lot of stuff, which is a whole other adult that we can head to at some point. But now, you can answer my trick question. In my first church, I had the confirmation kids and their parents, we had a Christmas party. And I cut out sections of each of the Matthew and Luke Christmas story, and I divided them into four groups. And I said, okay, here are all the pieces. Figure out which one goes with which gospel. You're Matthew, you're Mark, you're Luke, you're John. And I let it go in for like 20 minutes before I finally told the Mark and the John people, none of these have to do anything. It was mean of me. Um, but they never forgot. Um, Luke and Matthew are the only places. So um, some overall themes of Advent in Luther's preaching. Um, Advent 1 which is what we celebrate today, had a different text for Luther historically. And that was, uh, often it was the text of Palm Sunday, Christ coming into Jerusalem. So it really is about the second coming, rather than baby Jesus coming. Um, and Luther preaches a lot in this first week of Advent on Christ coming as a beggar, Christ being an alternative sort of king with no notions of gold or riches or extravagance. Um, and Luther focuses and lifts up Christ's coming in lowliness, in meekness, and sorrowful of heart. So that's kind of, again, Luther's really focused on, on the lowness, on the humanness of uh, what Christ's coming brings. He says, Christ is a lowly king. He is sin's devourer and death's strangler. He disembodies the devil. That's a little uh, grisly for 9.30 on a Sunday morning. But at the same time, he says, Christ comes as a gift and blessing, not to frighten or drive away or crush, but to help and to carry our burdens. The other focus for Luther is on the direction of Jesus. It's always that the king comes down and not that we go up. We'll never get good at climbing the spiritual ladder. Um, and Luther focuses even on the sacraments. It's that the king comes to us through the humility of word and of water and of bread and wine. Um, and so that's part of Luther's focus in Advent. The other thing that comes up in the second week of Advent is that Luther focuses on the double Advent of Christ. We talk about that a little bit in church today, where the first Advent, Christ coming as a baby, Christ comes as a humble servant, offering the greatest service um, to humankind. But the second advent, the second coming of Jesus, Christ will come again. Uh, Martin Luther saw Christ as coming as the master to free us from earth, and in only the way Luther can say he says, to free us from earth, maggoty mire, death, and decay. <laughs> maggoty mire. <laughs> He, is not a, he does not have a high view of humankind. No. <laughs> um, he also sings, sees Jesus talking apocalyptically, talking about the end times like we hear in the gospel today, as being about Jesus as a stern comforter who comes not to judge, but to save and redeem. 
And lest we think Luther cared about other preachers, he did. Um, he said, I must warn against the godless, fanatical preachers in sermons who would deprive people of the grace of Jesus Christ and instead focus on terrifying the people to prepare for the last day by relying on their good works as satisfaction. And that's, that's Luther to the core. Um, and, and he saw, even in his time, this notion of, of what I sometimes uh, pejoratively call Methodist preaching. Um, where it's all about what we do that gets us closer to God, or to salvation, or what have you. And so, thinking about a text like today with the, the phrase, stay awake, I, would, I, say, I think Luther would say there's lots of godless fanatic preachers who are preaching today. If you don't stay awake, God's going to get you. And I read some commentaries this week, and that's definitely the tone that people read these Jesus kind of apocalyptic texts in Advent. And it was really helpful to study for this, because <laughs> it helped me focus a little bit in preaching on, on how do we offer here a word of stern comfort and not a word of terror. You know, I, I always think, uh, whenever Jesus uses a comparison, um, there's, a, there's a great verse in 2 Timothy about being utensils of the Lord. Um, and I always said, but what if I'm a spork? <laughs> um, and so too, when we hear all these commands, stay awake, um, be watchful, um, don't, you know, whatever it is in Advent, um, I think Luther gives us a helpful interpretive lens to say it's not staying awake for the sake of our own goodness or our own salvation. And that's, that's a pretty pure understanding of how Luther sees grace. Yeah, Joe? But in the Garden of Gethsemane, he complains to his disciples that they could not stay awake with him. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and part of that, I think, is is the relation and community and protection. I mean, so it's not that it's not that that's not an important command, but that it isn't what Jesus or God is going to use as the ultimate kind of judgment lens. Um, I just heard a joke a few weeks ago that there are three people in heaven um, waiting to get in, and Peter <coughs> says to the first one, "Welcome to heaven. Nice to meet you. Um, could you spell the word love for me?" And the person goes, "L O V E. Well, welcome. Come on in." The second person comes up, well, hi, welcome to heaven. Would you spell the word hope? H-O-P-E. Great. Third person comes up and says, Peter says, uh, welcome to heaven. Uh, would you spell Czechoslovakia? <laughs> and the guy goes, come on. What is it? What is it? You know, like, I, I just heard these other people in front of me spell these easy words. And St. Peter says, I'm not really sure. I just never liked you very much. You know? <laughs> That's not the way God operates, right? That's the way we operate, which is part of what makes the joke funny. <clears throat> um, the other focus of, of Advent preaching for Luther is John the Baptist. He saw John the Baptist as pointing to Jesus as the Lamb of God. Um, but he also saw John the Baptist in his kind of ruddy, uh, granola, outdoor guy nature um, as being another offense people took. John the Baptist, he's not like us. He doesn't dress well. He doesn't shave. You know? um, and so Luther sees also in John the Baptist the way that people are so easily offended by Christ's lowness, by Christ's misery and poverty. Um, for Luther, Christmas preaching was simple. It was often narrative, so it focused on retelling the Christmas story. Um, and his focus tended to be on the wonder and the marvel of God becoming human. Um, but it's not just that Jesus becomes our flesh, it's that why Jesus becomes our flesh that's important for Luther. Um, incarnation is never divorced from atonement, what happens on the cross. And so for Luther, Christmas is always birth in the light of death. Um, some of that's the dark ages that he was coming out of, that, that death is a, a more prevalent, I think, everyday occurrence for people. Um, but also, um, and Bishop Eaton last year in the Lutheran magazine wrote a lovely article about the cross on Christmas Eve. Um, 
talks about Christmas comes through Good Friday too. And he said, in the background of the manger is always the cross. Um, and that's a part of my Lutheran upbringing that has never been emphasized. I don't know about you all, uh, but the notion of, of Good Friday, Easter, and Christmas all kind of living together, maybe your, your church community is focused on that. That's something I think, at least in my understanding of contemporary Lutheranism, we've lost a little bit. Um, that we focus a lot on the love of God and the incarnation. We focus a lot on the blessing, on the miracle, on the wonder. Um, but that we don't focus as much on the cross. Um, a couple of other contextual pieces that are helpful. Um, Luther is always trying to connect the Bible to 1500s Germany. And so Luther um, sees Bethlehem... Uh, in terms of a little foreign German mountain town. <laughs> um, but he also focuses on God being in the depths, in the pit, in the, in the cavernous places of our own humanity and in our own life. And he sees that for Jesus to be born at all is another sign of God's foolishness that rivals or equals that of the cross being foolishness. Paul talks about that in, in 1 Corinthians. Um, Luther says that the manger is equally, if not more foolish, um, than even that Jesus would choose to die, or that God would choose for Jesus to die. Um, one of the things that, uh, anyone here ever see Talladega Nights, The Legend of Ricky Bobby? <laughs> Dear six pound, eight ounce, blue eyed, baby Jesus. <laughs> um, Luther is not, and part of this is there's a lot of infant mortality, Luther is not focused at all on the sentimental being part. <coughs> of Jesus, which is another reason a way in the manger may not be attributed to Luther. <laughs> it might come later. Um, but that for him, the crib, the manger, is holding God in flesh. And so it's marvelous, it's wonderful, but it's not cute for Luther. It's not sentimental. Um, which again is a part that's different from our culture, I think, when sometimes we kind of glorify the babiness of Jesus. <laughs> And I love that movie because it does it better than any <laughs> preaching ever could. <laughs> but what's important uh, for Luther, too, is that Jesus, the baby, isn't an angel. Because an angel, in Luther's worldview, is blameless, is pure, is divine, is white and glorified. And Luther says, God sets the course in choosing the lowly, the poor human nature, lost in sin, and God sinks to the lowest depths, raising our humanity and exalting our flesh. And so Christ is not an angel, but is our brother. Um, which is, again, a really intimate connection that I think we don't always, um, or at least I don't always think about when it comes time to thinking about Christmas. Now, Luther and Mary have an interesting relationship. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and part of that is Luther is still Roman Catholic, <laughs> even though he doesn't agree with some of the abuses of the Roman Catholic Church. His, his goal was never to be different. And so Luther sees Mary as important because she is human. She gives real, natural birth to Jesus, and she is his actual fleshly mother. And he was born in pain. And so Luther is very critical of these notions of, of Mary's painless birth, of Mary's magical kind of pop-out delivery without any, any birth pangs. Um, he sees those as being antithetical to why God becomes flesh in the first place. Um, in fact, I just saw a piece of art on Facebook, of all places, yesterday, of Mary and Eve consoling one another <laughs> with the serpent wrapped around the heel. It was beautiful. It's almost like an icon of, of a pregnant Mary, or in blue, of course, um, <laughs> I need to figure out why that is. Um, but that, uh, and so for Luther, Mary is that kind of connection of the second Eve, that birthing of, of Christ, and the fulfilling of the promise of Genesis 2 and 3. <coughs> me, that God isn't just going to like choose painlessness in this. It's going to be the real thing. Um, he also sees Mary as being worthy of our praise, uh, worthy of our th uh, invo involvement because she is a model of faith. Mary heard the message. She believed this messenger, Gabriel. She conceived, she carried, she delivered. 
And so for Luther, the virgin birth is whatever. He calls it a trifle compared to Mary's faith in being able to trust. Faith not as like, I get this in my head. Faith is simply trusting. You're going to have a baby and it's going to be God's son. And we, all we know is Mary says, okay. And for, for Luther, that's a really powerful work of, it's not up to us to create faith. It's the work of the Spirit that creates that faith within us. Um, a couple of other pieces, and then we'll hop into some reading, because I'm also tired of talking. Um, <coughs> for Luther, it's not enough that Christ is born. It's a message that has to be shared. So I think Luther would have liked to go tell it on the mountain um, as a Christmas hymn. Um, he said it's our task as Christians to unhide the hidden God born in our world and in our flesh. Um, and then most of the Christmas story, the, the inn, the manger, the barn, all of that is about God's hiddenness. God comes into the world, but God doesn't like go to the palace in Jerusalem and, and have you know, those flashing marquee lights and say, here I come, right? <laughs> It requires tellers, the shepherds, the wise people, um, to share in that story. Um, and, interestingly, he sees the angels as being our tutors. The angels seem to be the only ones who get it in the Christmas story. They're praising and worshiping the whole time. And Luther says it's the angels who tutor us in what true worship looks like. We see and we sing glory to God in the highest and peace among all people. Um, shepherds are another example of poverty, lowness, um, God being in the ruddy and the muddy. Um, and Luther thinks it's interesting that shepherds don't leave their calling. After they hear the news, what do they do? Do they become the first apostles? No, they go back to the fields. Um, and one of the things Luther talks about often is that, that everyone has their own calling. And for him, shepherds were called to be shepherds. And that they, could, they were called to bear the news of Jesus, but they were also called to tend their flocks. Um, and, and that connects to his idea of priesthood of all believers, being that we all have our own callings, we all share the message of Jesus in our hearts, but that we also have our own like earthly tasks. And then, uh, the one hymn that uh, Luther is known to have written that we use a lot is From Heaven Above. Uh, it's on a lot of the Christmas CDs that you might listen to. <laughs> um, From heaven above to earth I come, da 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 da. Um, and it's a, a lovely hymn, Von Himmel hoch auf Deutsch. And it highlights the three main focuses of Luther's Christmas teaching. Anti-sentimental, anti-consumer, and anti-moralistic. And I think those things are things that hold true for our own preaching about uh, Advent and Christmas as well. Um, that it, for Luther, it's all about grace of God in our flesh. So that's a lot of background information, but let's hop into, uh, these are some direct quotes from Luther's Advent and Christmas sermons. Would someone like to read uh, this first one for us? Read out loud. God does not even send an angel to take the devil by the nose. He sends, as it were, an earthworm lying in weakness, helpless, without his mother, and he suffers him to be nailed to a cross. And through weakness, he takes the power and the kingdom. Well, there's the gospel in a nutshell. <laughs> Luther, I think more than almost anyone else, has a super what we in, in theology call a low anthropology. He understands human nature to be flawed and to never get any better. Um, and so uh, one of my professors always said, I am worm and nothing more will I ever be. And part of that is because Luther saw God as the only source of human goodness, which runs contrary to, I think, how most of us have been taught that we're inherently good, and that we can get better all the time. <laughs> Maybe. You know, I don't, I don't have a lot of evidence in that in my own life. Um, but, but this is essentially Luther's thought that, that what makes Jesus powerful is that he's not an angel. Jesus is a human. He's an earthworm. He's weak as a baby. He's vulnerable. Um, 
And then again, we see he connects it to the cross too. It's through weakness that, that God, God's love is made perfect. Um, so here's, I think this is a really good example of, of Christmas and Good Friday being held um, together. Other thoughts or questions about this one? Does, does Luther suffer from depression? <laughs> well, that's a great question. There's a great, uh, there's a great historical scholar named Eric Erickson. Can you imagine he was Scandinavian? Um, and he, uh, with some critical panning and, and some critical appreciation, um, tries to do a psychological study of Luther. And it, it doesn't come up with anything because, just like, uh, I think it was Rudolf Bultmann who said, no matter how far you look down into the wells of history to find Jesus, you see your own reflection coming back at you. So too, it, it is with most people who've tried to study Luther's psychology. What they end up doing is projecting their own stuff onto him. Um, but that said, there is a lot we know about Luther's uh, personal turmoil, about sin, about being unworthy. Uh, I thought the video we watched with the saints, the Martin Luther documentary, was really good at showing the impact of that. Um, but it's likely Luther did not have a very optimistic outlook about himself um, or the world, save for what he knew in Jesus um, and what he knew about God's righteousness. Yeah, Joe? I think Luther suffers from being a German in the 1500s. <laughs> I think that's excellent. Luther suffers from being a German in the 1500s. He's coming, I mean, it's medieval. It's, it's a muddy life. And if you ever read anything about Luther's bowel issues, he writes about them <laughs> interminably. Um, yeah, I mean, we're coming out of time of the, the Black Death. We're coming out of all these pieces. And so, so the, the focus on kind of mortality and, and shadowy stuff it is really present. Um, but again, Luther finds great hope in the midst of that, in the notion that God's love isn't dependent upon him or upon anyone else. And I think that's true just as much for us today as it is otherwise. Yeah, Carl. You know, for me, in Luther's time, he didn't see people taking the reality of sin seriously, like today. In other words, they could satisfy their own need to correct the wrong. Yeah. So therefore, circumvent grace. Until you deal with sin, you can't deal with grace. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that's, we can say that's a low image of humanity, but... I, I have a low anthropology, and it's funny, because when I first started dating my wife, the lady's like, you just think so, so poorly of humans. I think we're, we have some inherent good in us. And as we've been in ministry together, she goes, I think you might have been right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll mark that one in the uh, scoreboard, it doesn't matter. Uh, all right, let's look at the next one here. Assuming that it works. <clears throat> All right, would someone read this next one? When the power of humans fail, the power of God begins, provided faith is present and expectant. When the oppression is ended, then one sees what strength lies below the weakness. Even so was Christ powerless on the cross, and yet he was most mighty there and overcame sin, death, world, hell, devil, and all ill. So can you imagine hearing this in a Christmas sermon? <laughs> no, right? <laughs> um, but again, it's Luther's focus on, on God working despite, through uh, weakness. Um, and that what gives hope for Luther is that there will be an end to oppression. There will be an end, a little bit connected to Mark's gospel today. The people who've already seen the temple be destroyed, they've seen that end. And so that frees them in some way to see that there is strength below human weakness that comes from God, that comes from without <coughs> ourselves. Um, and so Luther, Luther tends to think, again, this connects a little bit to um, our own notion of, in my mind, this is one of the ways he answers the question, why is there suffering? Um, and that is, we see that Christ suffers, um, and we see that even when we think Jesus is powerless, uh, whether it's an infant or on the cross, that it's there that God is defeating the power of evil and sin and death in the world and all that stuff. So that, that again, 
It's about what God is able to do through, in spite of, me in a state. Um, that's important. So that's a little bit more uh, Good Friday theology than Christmas theology, right? All right, who wants to read our next one here? These are just interesting passages. Um, all right, this is about virgin birth. Does someone want to read this one? The virgin birth is a mere trifle for God. That God should become human is a greater miracle. <coughs> but most amazing of all is that this maiden should credit the announcement that she, rather than some other virgin, had been chosen to be the mother of God. She held fast to the word of the, of the angel because she had become a new creature. Even so, we must be transformed and renewed in heart from day to day. So we were encountering here Luther's talk about Mary, Mary. but also about us. So we talked a little bit in our, my earlier notes about Luther acknowledges the virgin birth, um, but he sees what's more, <coughs> more miraculous even than that is that Mary goes along with it um, and has receives the faith um, to believe. Uh, I love this. Uh, she credits the announcement that it's her and not some other virgin who's been chosen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that uh, because most, think about most prophets in the Bible. When God chooses them, what is their typical response? Heck no! <laughs> but then we don't necessarily ever see that from Mary in the Gospel of Luke. Um, and so for Luther, that's, and Luther was an Old Testament junkie. Um, that's his primary research as a, as a professor. He found Jesus under every rock in the Old Testament, and even some rocks that weren't there, he yeah. still found Jesus. Um, but um, to see that Mary goes, goes along with, with the message and the power of God without any, any sort of question is a powerful thing for Luther. But also, I love this notion, I've never thought about this, that Mary holds fast because God has made her a new creature. Yeah, what does that mean? Um, essentially, that, that God's presence, God's favor and grace upon her makes her a new creation. That she accepted it, and then she became a new creature. Well, that even, even without her acceptance, that, that, that all of that, even her, the work of the Spirit to transform her to be open and even accepted at all, is already what Luther would say would be the work of God. Um, and so this notion that Mary becomes a new creature before Jesus becomes the new Adam. Right. To me, really connects back to this, because all over the place, Luther talks about Jesus Christ is, the, is God's transforming. The old Adam in us yeah. were made into the new creation, new creatures, um, through the love of Jesus. And so, to me, Mary and Eve go hand in hand for Luther. It's all subtle and implicit. But I think it, I, I see it there at least. So you can agree or disagree. We could have a good uh, debate about that. Chuck, yeah. Well, I, I, I was so, sort of thinking, like, what choice did she have? You know, like the prophets. Uh, yeah. I mean, they could say, no, God, I'm not going to do that. And they could run away. Jonah didn't work very well for him. But, right. But, uh, um, you know, maybe there were other prophets that just said, no, I'm not going to do that. But Mary, you know, she, you know she, I don't think she had a choice. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and I think there is a lot of truth to that. Luther chooses to really focus on, on that being the miracle of, of the visitation story. Yeah, Carl. When we talk about Luther and a low image of humanity, I believe that he's got a high image in Christ. That we, we always love to say, oh, I'm only human when I screw up. Well, I kind of see communion as the gift or the transformation of where God chooses <coughs> us in our humanity to bear his presence. You yes. Know what I'm saying? We become Christ bearers, as it were, to the world. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's a new, that's a transformation. Yeah. Absolutely. And the, and the transformation is daily. And right. where else do we hear about daily transformation in Luther's thinking? Baptism. Baptism. We are daily called to drown in the waters of baptism and be raised up and born anew. Yeah, so this is, again, uh, and it's hard because Luther is not systematic, even though he's German. Amen. So he says 14 different things about the same thing. Yeah, go. 
is God still sending angels to people? I don't know anybody that saw an angel, and I don't think I ever saw an angel. Um, is this is this a flaw in me? I don't think it's a flaw in in you. Um, the word angel uh, literally means messenger. So that in that sense, I think that. I can look back on my life and know there were plenty of human messengers of God, but the notion of, of angels kind of being divine beings with wings, um, Della Reese just died this past, yeah. this past week, and so my family was reliving our memories of watching Touched by an Angel every night, <laughs> or every Sunday in our house. We'd have dinner, I'd put off doing my homework, and I'd watch it. You know, so I don't think we necessarily have those visions of angels, although... Um, if you've had that experience, I don't want to poo-poo that. <laughs> um, but I think there isn't, I think the angelology <laughs> that Luther approaches here is a product, just like his focus on the devil, of his time period. Um, and so that as we've adapted, as theology has shifted, we've come to see messengers of God in a different way. But that doesn't mean there isn't multiple ways God could come and visit someone. Um, but I think it's a lot less prevalent, uh, at least than the scriptures say. So I don't, I don't think it's personal fault. Um, a, a good teacher of mine could speak in tongues, um, which was an interesting experience. Um, but he was always keen to say, this is a spiritual gift that I have received, but it is not a marker of my goodness as a Christian. Um, it's not a marker of my being favored and you being disfavored. And I would say the same thing would hold true if someone has had kind of an angel or God talk or visitation experience, um, that that might be actually, pre I'm not going to question the dubiousness or the reality of that, but that isn't a marker of they've got it right and we don't because we haven't, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, Gordon. On this side of the cross, do we need to be concerned about angels coming to us, or should we just be happy and thankful that the Holy Spirit is with us full time once Jesus sent the Spirit to us? To me, the Holy Spirit is a replacement of the angels. Ah, that's a, that's interesting. Yeah, that that we see the Holy Spirit, the giving of that in John's Gospel, also in Luke at Pentecost. That could be a nice a nice way of thinking about that. Okay, the Holy Spirit in our understanding of God. And it takes over um, for that. That's a good way to think about it. Yeah. I have no definitive answers <laughs> um, on angels and the like. Let's keep going because we have lots more fun quotes. Um, I don't want to lose y'all. Stay awake! <laughs> All right. This is an interesting one. Um, Luther reads the Bible, what we would say literally. And that's not in the sense of Every word is true, not inerrantly, but literally in the sense that every word is there for some purpose and reason. Um, and so he, Luther would not be a big fan of, fan of biblical paraphrase. <laughs> um, so if someone would read this one, this is a little bit of what Luther tries to do to make sense of that whole governmental junk at the beginning of Luke 2 that always makes the reader on Christmas Eve leery. Quirinius was governor of Syria. Uh, would someone read this section here? The birth of Christ was timed to coincide with the census because God wanted to teach us the duty, us the duty of obedience, even to a heathen government. Christ and his parents had to give evidence of obedience from the very first moment of his life. This is the strongest proof that Christ's kingdom is to be distinguished from that of the world. So this is a place where I don't necessarily agree with Luther. Um, although it is consistent with how Luther understands the role of God and the role of government. And part of that is a, part, a product of his historical world. Luther's living in the time of the Holy Roman Empire, in some ways, uh, whereby uh, the, the church and the princes are somewhat um, united together. Um, and as someone once said, the unholy Roman Empire <laughs> is more like it. And so um, 
This is the place where Luther is speaking from his historical context. Uh, and again, there are parts of this that make a lot of sense to me. Um, but Luther also writes in another place that it is the role of a Christian to stand up when the government is taking advantage of people. Mm-hmm. It's called the, and Luther has this whole notion of the two kingdoms theory. That is, there's a kingdom of God, and that God, God has ordained and established a kingdom of civil authority and ruling. And that under normal circumstances, those are to be respected. There's no separation of church and state. You know, so it's, it's funky. But um, at the bottom, it is that Christ's kingdom is distinguishable from the ways of the world. But he sees Mary and Joseph being called to the census as a, a product. Um, they had to show they were obedient to Rome because Jesus had to work through the systems that were to transform the world. That for Jesus to say, I'm going to be born in, eh, screw y'all, <laughs> isn't going to work. Um, although, what happens in Matthew's Gospel with Herod um, is different than in this, this story here. Yeah, that's right. But in a sense, being obedient is part of the incarnation. No, working, yes. Working through the earthly means. Obedience earthly is part of the incarnation. That God, God is giving up some control here right. by becoming human flesh. Right. And that means God's going to have to work through the Roman Empire as heathen as it might be and likely is from the history that we know, especially towards Jewish people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, live in the messiness of the human condition. Right. Exactly. Right. So Jesus isn't going to be an escapist from birth. <laughs> so there is... There is some truth here, but it's one of those that, taking this out of context, it can be really easy to say, and this is where it's important too, we worship who? Jesus, God, not Luther. Sometimes I think one of the, the things that happens with the Lutherism is that we become, we become uh, Lutheridolatrous. Oh, did you make that up? I did. Um, <laughs> and that we end up idolizing an idolatry, uh, idolatry, whatever that word is, making idols out of Luther's writings. <laughs> to the point, of, if Luther said it, then we have to do it exactly that way. Um, and so you'll find across the Lutheran spectrum, there's plenty of people who would argue, it's a little bit like the Constitution. <laughs> uh, they're Luther originalists versus, versus Luther and adapters. Um, and there's value in both of those. Uh, you might see those specifically within different synods, um, Wisconsin, Missouri, ELCA, that there's different notions of how, how literally we follow what Luther said um, as opposed to not. So you have plenty of space in my freedom to disagree with Luther on any of these things. In fact, I think he'd like it. I have no idea if that's actually true. <laughs> All right, this is one of my favorites if someone would read this section here. Why did Mary ponder these things in her heart? Because she too was in need of preaching. Even though she was the mother and had borne the child of God, she had need to ponder these words in her heart in order to strengthen her faith and increase her assurance. She reflected on how these words corresponded to those of the angel. This was her great joy and confirmation. Luther likes preaching. (laughs) Luther is a preacher. Um, But Luther understands the word of God is something we need on the regular. It's something we need to hear. It's something that hearing the word transforms us. Um, I heard a presenter this fall talk about how she needs to go to church to get a little broken and then to hear God's word of grace comfort her. That's like Luther in one-on-one. And so it's so fascinating to me that Luther sees... And Mary took these things and pondered them in her heart and connects it to the preached word. I would never have thought to have gone there. It's why I like Luther. Um, But listen, did you notice in the bottom what, what preaching does? It strengthens Mary's faith. Notice it doesn't increase it. Luther would say we have the same amount of faith from birth to death. That we receive faith through the Holy Spirit um, as a gift of our baptism, um, as a gift of God's created us, and that we can't actually grow in faith. 
which runs contrary to like 85 different notions of like phrases and hymns and other things. Um, but that strengthening faith, I think for Luther is a different tone. Um, also, that she would increase her level of assurance. Help her to believe it when she feels like she can't. It's why we say the creed together. You ever notice that you've ne probably never said the creed alone unless you got tested by your pastor in the office when you were getting confirmed? We always say it together because there might be a day where I need Pastor Ray's faith to say it loud and proud because I'm not sure I believe it. <laughs> or I might need a day you know, where, where I'm feeling particularly weak or I'm, not, uh, I'm strong in a way that can offer help to someone else's weakness. And so I think it's interesting that Mary sees that part of uh, her faith through these words as well. Um, I've never thought of pondering those words as being Mary taking the angel's sermon and holding it. But think about what it says. Do not be afraid. God has shown favor to you. Um, well, that's, I could take that as a daily assurance of grace. So, like, if I went, and interestingly, my favorite biblical passage is the Annunciation, Luke 1.30. Um, do not be afraid. The Lord has called you favored, has shown you grace. Um, so indeed, it is kind of a little sermon. Um, and I think that's a cool connection that I've never, never seen in paper or in print. Should we do some more? Sure. All right. So Matthew, at the very beginning of the gospel, has all of these names of, of genealogy that get him there. And Matthew includes some really... Um, Less than stellar people in that genealogy included um, are, uh, I think King David is part of that, uh, not perfect. Also included are uh, the daughters of Lot, um, who are connected to uh, their father and incest and other pieces. Um, Ruth, who is a Moabite, all of these outsiders are in Matthew's genealogy. And Luther says, why are all these messed up people in the Bible? And here's what he says. Someone want to read this? In the genealogy of Jesus and Matthew, God holds before us this mirror of sinners, that we may know that he is sent to sinners, and from sinners is willing to be born. Boy, that's grace. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Um, why are all those messed up people in the genealogy? Because that's what God's about. God loves messed up people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the Old Testament. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's just a lovely, a lovely uh, passage of really kind of describing Luther's thought uh, in a nutshell. All right. Let's do two more. So Luther... Uh, goes into a hearty debate. Again, he wrote, he read the Bible literally in the sense of these words are here for a reason. But um, he gets into a long discussion, probably with himself, but also probably with some other pastors or preachers or teachers, about what night do the kings arrive to visit Jesus? <laughs> Is it the twelfth night? Is it, he goes, yeah, I would have taken at least 60 days. What if it's the same night? So this is what we call um, a pastor's favorite uh, pastime, going down a pointless theological rabbit hole. Um, if you come to Wednesday Bible study, you know I'm game for these on the regular basis. I can see Nancy Bowen looking at me like, come on, Pastor Matt, let's keep going. Um, and so let's hear what Luther has to say about these kind of uh, trivial, uh, germane things in the Bible. That which is not written in God's word does not need to be regarded as an article of faith. The point of the Gospels is that the prophecy was fulfilled. Uh, <laughs> don't major on minor issues. Does it matter what night the kings arrived? Did they come? Yes. Did it say what the prophets foretold? Yes. Did they bring gifts? Yes. Were there three of them? We have no idea, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> they brought three gifts, but, you know, 
Maybe somebody brought two in one hand. I don't know. Um, I just think that's a helpful, again, there's this full of wisdom in this in these Christmas sermons. I guess I should read Luther more. I get excited by these things, if you didn't notice. All right, here's another one. Fear not, said the angel. I fear death, the judgment of God, the world hunger, and the like. The angel announces a savior who will free us from fear. Not a word is said about our merits and works, but only of the gift we are to receive. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's, this is, this is Luther on Luke. Um, I couldn't say it any better myself. And I love Luther's honesty. I fear death, the judgment of God, I fear the world, I fear hunger, and the like. Insert your own fill-in-the-blank fears here. And if preaching doesn't address those things, it feels like cheap grace. <laughs> you know, um, I think it, it's just a rich, the richness of God's grace. Okay, I can do one more. I had 18. I think we've made it through like 11. So we've done good, everybody. All right, this is uh, connecting to, again, what happens after hardship, after grief, loss, struggle. Um, and this is connected to the struggle of Mary giving birth, which is really interesting. Um, so let's see what Luther says here. After a spiritual struggle, God is so heartfelt, so near and clear, that not only does a person forget the anguish and the struggle, but they are endeared to God. This is, I think, where the, the very beginnings of Luther is what we call the theology of the cross. That God is present where God seems most hidden. That God is present in the midst of the, the depths of human suffering. And that even what we might consider to be a tragic, painful, real, visceral experience of pain, of loss, of grief, um, or of spiritual torment, of doubt, of disbelief, um, I love that this is connected to Mary's birthing. Because again, there's this tradition that says Mary gave birth to Jesus and it didn't have any pain. She remained a virgin, all this other stuff, right? And Luther is able to take that and transform it into something far more, I think, true about our own human experience. And maybe you've had this experience that after a spiritual struggle, you reach a point in grief, a point in your own life where God feels so close or near or heartfelt he uses the example of Mary holding the Christ child to her bosom, that not only does a person forget the anguish and the struggle, but they even find themselves even more in love with God. I think that's just a lovely ideal um, for what faith can be. But again, it doesn't become a lit litmus test. So if you've never felt like deeply endeared to God, Luther does not mean this as a means of like, you need to feel this way or else. You aren't a good Christian. No, that's not... <laughs> Not what Luther's about. Okay, can I squeeze one more in? And then I need to really go. Here we go. This is great. This is a perfect one to end on. Um, would someone read this out loud for us? If we Christians would join the wise men, we must close our eyes to all that glitters before the world and look rather on the despised and foolish things, help the poor, comfort the despised, and aid the neighbor in his need. Or her need. <laughs> <laughs> Do not boast that you have built churches and endowed masses. God will say, what do I care about your altars and your bells? Amen. Um, what a lovely reminder for us, I think. But also what a lovely reminder that Luther... We often forget this, and there was a whole book last year, Cindy Crane was here to talk about the forgotten Luther about economic justice. And, and I think, I mean, Luther wasn't living in a hyper-consumer culture, but I think this holds even more true for us now. These are words that have grown in their magnitude um, over the centuries. So if you'd like, uh, if you can wrestle to borrow this book of Christmas sermons, if you're really engaged, and, um, and we can order some too if you want to. Um, I think it's like nine bucks if you want to order them, or you can borrow my copy. Um, can I just look at them till I'll bring them back to you? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I just want Judy claims first rights, so that's yes. good. <laughs> and I'll wrestle anyone. <laughs> the name Israel means the one who struggles or wrestles with God. 
So we're living out our faith that way. Um, thank you, everybody, for your attention and for uh, wrestling with these parts of Luther. And hopefully it's both edifying and deepening for our own understanding of God's grace. Yes. Go in peace.